Let the church say amen. amen. You know that when we sing or speak or think or feel that he is the Lord, it means that we are simultaneously singing, speaking, thinking, feeling the truth that no one else is. There is but one Lord, and when we claim him to be Lord of our lives, we are confessing that he has the ultimate authority over our lives. That means no other person and no other thing, no other season, no other experience. If I can just speak clearly about it, fear is not Lord. Shame and guilt are not Lord. Anger is not Lord, but he is Lord. So if we claim that he is the Lord, then we have something to celebrate. Amen? I want to turn our attention to 1 John chapter 1. This will be the place where we will anchor our attention throughout this message. John 1 John chapter 1. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the anatomy of the scripture, of the Bible, it's okay. No worries. What you do with 1 John is just go to the back of the book first. And you start at maps and work backward. Behind the maps, you get to Revelation, then Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. It's just toward the back. And we'll be there in just a moment. But before we do, I need to tell you about something that happened a few Easter's ago. Back before the pandemic, I used to have a habit on Sunday mornings of going to Starbucks every Sunday morning. That was an every week kind of thing. And then Laura did the budget and realized we got to cut that out. So we stopped it, you know. And, but the problem was I would go in each Sunday and have the most wonderful time because there was a group of men that would gather there every Sunday. They were there every day. Great group of guys and they would, they would just visit with each other. Just a mixture of backgrounds and beliefs, a variety of religions, some believing, some unbelieving. And every Sunday I'd walk in and they'd say, hey, Sean, so what's the, uh, what's the topic today? What's your speech about? And I would tell them, and it would make me, it was a good discipline because I would have to practice uh, kind of reducing it down to an elevator speech, which I know you don't believe I can do, but I promise I, I could do it. And I, and I would, I would tell them what I'm talking about. We have a great discussion for a minute that I'd go on about the day. I remember one Easter when I walked in and got coffee and sat for just a moment, what you talking about today? I'm talking about resurrection today. And one of the guys said to me, I've got a question for you. Um, when it comes to resurrection, when you all say you believe that he was raised from the dead, do you mean, you know, like literally that he was raised from the dead or is that more like symbolic? And I said, yes. Yes, we believe that he was physically, bodily raised from the dead, that he died, he breathed his last, and then on the third day, God raised him and physically was seen by people. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I said, but you know, even, even beyond that, you know that part of you that piqued some curiosity enough to ask me that question? That's resurrection too. I want to talk about the power of resurrection in our lives today. We're told in some of the most ancient manuscripts that we have that after he was raised from the dead, he was seen by more than 500 people, eyewitnesses. He was seen by the women and seen by the apostles and then ultimately by 500 people all at once. And do you know the strangest mystery of all, the scandal of it all is that nobody took a single picture that entire time. <laughs> Not a single video was recorded. Nothing was posted on Instagram. And it was on nobody's be real. There was no like selfie in front of an empty tomb, you know, hashtag not here. Hey, you know, he's written. None of, none of that happened. And, and, and yet, and yet the greatest evidence that it happened were the people 
who saw him and then in seeing him alive experienced such a radical change in their lives that they were never ever the same. The resurrection of Jesus changed the way they, they did everything. They changed the way they viewed their lives. It changed how they saw each other. It changed how they ordered their lives. It changed how they welcomed a stranger. It changed how they forgave a debtor. It changed how they, how they loved not just their neighbors, but how they even Love their enemies. The resurrection of Jesus changed everything about the lives of the first people who saw him after the resurrection. One of the most beautiful ex uh, expressions of that kind of change that came to their life comes from Carl Don or Carl uh, Paul Donfried. Listen to this beautiful description of the kind of transformation that came to the lived experiences of people who saw him. The early church did not ask its followers to, to simply imitate or observe some static principles of Christianity, but rather to so comprehend the significance of the Christ event that they could dynamically actualize its implications in the situations in which they lived. The freedom for this actualization and application to the concrete existential situation can only be comprehended when one recognizes that these early Christians were not worshiping some dead prophet of Nazareth, but rather essential to their very existence was the conviction that this Jesus was raised from the dead by God, was now Lord of the church and present in their very real life. It is this presence of the risen one that both compelled and allowed the early church to engage in such vigorous and dynamic teaching and proclamation. The greatest evidence that he was raised at all was the change that came into the lives of those who saw him and called him Lord, which raises a question for me and for you today. Is there any evidence at all in your lived experience called your life that demonstrates he actually was raised? Is there any evidence in the way we have ordered our lives that would give reason to those who are our neighbors outside of this church building to look at our lives and decide, mm, based on what I see in her and in him and in them, there must be something to this thing. You know, in the earliest church, the, one of the earliest church communities, the community of John, the Johannine community, those who gathered in the tradition of the gospel writer John, they described what it meant to experience the resurrection of Jesus by seeing him and the implications that it had upon their lives. We read about it in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Listen to these, these gorgeous words words. From the very first day, we were there taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it, we heard it, and now we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience, by the way, check out what it's not saying. We're telling you all this so that you can think about it. We're telling you all this so you can consider it. We're, we're telling you all this so that you can assent to a set of doctrines and beliefs that we all agree on. No, we're telling you all this so that you can experience this resurrection. The experience of communion with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. 
your joy will double our joy. Could anything be more beautiful than an eyewitness longing for those of us who were not there at the time to believe and not simply believe, but to open our hearts and lives up to literally experience the love of a resurrected Lord, which raises a question for me on this Easter Sunday. Have you experienced the resurrection? Have you experienced this inner aliveness that is so compelling and so transformational that it changes everything about how you order your life? And I know... What some of you may be feeling and thinking today, I know that there is someone gathered here who who wants to say, yeah, I want to. I want to believe. And I want to experience all that you're describing. It's just that I've had so many other experiences that have left me so wounded. I really have a lot of trouble just swallowing that big old pill. I don't know if I really believe it because I've seen some things I know, I know. And I know that it's possible that maybe you know your church history and we all know that in the history of the church, the church has done some horrible things in the name of Jesus. I mean, is it okay on Easter Sunday when we celebrate the risen Lord to simply confess into the universe we have done some terrible things in the name of the one who came to do wonderful things But I'm not asking you, have you encountered the church? And I know that there are some individuals who have, oh, they have claimed to wear the banner and the clothing of Jesus, and yet they live like they've never met the man. I know, because sometimes that's me, and sometimes that's you. But I'm not asking, have you met any good imitation of Christ? I'm asking today, have you met him? Have you experienced a transformation that comes from one and only one source in the universe? The man whom the father has raised up from the dead. Because I believe, I've I've got a conviction that most of us go looking to experience resurrection and life and, and faith and we assume that it looks only like these people over here and those people over there, and we never assume that it's possible to encounter the risen Christ in the messiness of my own lived experience. And I'm here to tell you what Paula Darcy reminds us of, that sometimes God comes to you disguised as your life. God comes to you disguised as your life and in the midst of what you might assume has nothing to do with holiness and and spiritual things and the presence of God. It may be that that's the very venue, the very, pe- because, because in scripture, we pay attention to a pattern that emerges and it repeats again and again and again. Every time at the end of each gospel where the risen Jesus is encountered by a person or a group of people, it is always, always in the context of some pain or some experience of suffering, some woundedness, some deep disillusionment when someone or some group of someones was about to just give it all up and walk the other way. It's there that Jesus shows up disguised as their lives. Can I just tell you about one or two? I mean, if I were to simply stay in the gospel of John, There are several appearances that Jesus makes in the lives of the people who are following him in the life of, in the gospel of John and John chapter 20 and John chapter 21. And when my son was asking, what what are you going to preach on Easter Sunday? What resurrection story? I couldn't make up my mind. So I just decided to do all of it. So can we start with Mary? Mary comes to the tomb, and when she arrives at the tomb, the stone has already been rolled away, and she doesn't know what to make of it, and she goes and gets two of the disciples and brings them, and they look in, and they begin the process of believing. Then they leave, and there she is by herself in the midst of confusion and disillusionment. She's weeping, 
And Jesus shows up and she doesn't know that it's Jesus. Isn't that the best? He shows up and she thinks that he's the gardener. And he says to her, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And she, thinking he's the gardener, says, they've taken my Lord. If you'll just tell me where they've laid him, I'll go and care for the body. And then Jesus, with his unmistakable voice, speaks her name, Mary. She turns and recognizes that it's Jesus. And she calls out in Aramaic, Rabuni, Rabbi, teacher. And she embraces him. And, and in that embrace, her soul is flooded with a, 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 just a barrage of memories. Rabbi, and every word that he had ever spoken and every good lesson he had ever taught and every good wonderful work and miracle and sign and wonder comes flashing in her mind. Oh, you're back. It's so good to see you again. And he does the strangest thing to her, this risen Lord. He says, stop clinging to me. And it's a little awkward. (laughs) And we don't know quite what to do about it. Now, he does say some things that make us theologize the moment. Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. And we can talk about that in another sermon altogether. But sometimes I think some of the most beautiful moments in Scripture are are not as complicated as we make them. She calls out, Rabbi, teacher. Oh, my old teacher, he's back. And and she's embracing him. He says, stop clinging to me. Stop clinging to what you used to know about me. Stop clinging to the only version of my life with your life that you know, because standing in front of you, there is something far greater than what you used to know. Some of us here are standing right in front of the risen Savior, and he's saying to you, stop clinging to the version of your story that you used to know. And I know that you wrote a script for your story. You wrote a script for what your life would look like, and then the thing happened, and it all fell apart. It's as if somebody took the script and just kind of threw it at your feet. I know, I know, but the risen Christ comes to all of us and says, I've got a better script for you. Stop clinging to what you no longer have control over and live. Sometimes he comes to us disguised as our lives, and yet that's not the only story in John chapter 20. That night they gather again somewhat in fear. We're told in John chapter 20 that they're, the disciples gather in this borrowed room behind locked doors. And the text literally says, out of fear for the religious leaders, because all they knew was this woman had this story about seeing Jesus, but nobody can really prove it yet. So, so it's probably hearsay. It's just an idle tale, Scripture says. And so they lock themselves up behind closed doors because that's what you do when you are afraid of an outcome you can't control. That's what you do. You are crippled with fear and the fear of being isolated. They might do to us what they did to him. And if you know what it's like to be crippled by a fear that you can't control the outcome of your life, well, then you're in good company. You're in that locked up room borrowed that night. And then to their greatest surprise, Jesus, the resurrected one, shows up in front of them, and he's there with them in the midst of that frightened room, and he says, peace, be with you. Look, here are my hands, and here's my side. Look, I am alive. He breathes on them, empowers them, and then he does something interesting. I've never really noticed it this way until this week. He makes them look at each other. He says, if you retain the sins of others, they'll be retained. But if you forgive the sins of others, they'll be, they'll be forgiven. You'll be free. Look at each other. You're not as alone as you think you are. See, sometimes God shows up disguised as your life. It may be possible that God is calling you to gather with one or two others. Because every time I gather with one or two others, I'm reminded, oh, you're doing the thing too. Oh, and you've been through this thing too. Oh, and you're carrying the same load that I thought I was carrying all by myself. Well, how about that? He's among us and in us and with us, and I never knew it. Sometimes he comes disguised as your life. The beauty of that room is that they look around and say, oh, he is alive. But there's one who wasn't in the room. His name was Thomas. And in the church, unfortunately, we've called Thomas 
doubting Thomas unfairly because he wasn't there that night and all week long the disciples kept telling him. In fact, in the Greek, it's an ongoing action. It says they kept on and on and on telling him he's alive. Trust me, he's alive. Take our word for it. And he says, I refuse to take your word for it because I've been through some things and I was burned when I used to take somebody's word for it without proving it myself. Somebody here understands what it's like to need proof. I don't like calling him Doubting Thomas. I like calling him what others have called him, uh, Honest Thomas, or Take It or Leave It Thomas, or uh, You See What You Get, You Get What You See Thomas. Because there he is. He's like, I don't I've been hurt before. Somebody here knows what it's like to have been so burned that you've got the scar tissue from the previous wound that makes you unable, literally unable to take somebody's word for it. You have to see for yourself. In fact, in the Greek, there is a moment there where they say, hey, just they keep on telling him he's alive, he's alive. And he says, I will not believe unless I see the scar prints in his hands and put my hand in the nail print or the scar in his side. I won't believe. But in Greek, the word is pistis, which means faith. He literally is saying, I can't have faith in someone unless I see their scars and somebody is here on an Easter Sunday morning and you've got a few scars from wounds that have caused you to need some proof and I'm here to say you've been shamed before by having doubts You've been made to feel less spiritual because you have some doubts about this thing and I'm here to tell you that Thomas is here to tell us that doubt is not the opposite of faith. That the doubt is not a lack of faith. Doubt is an act of faith because to get there, it's not a binary choice. It's not either you are a believer or a doubter. But if we're all honest, if you've never had a doubt, come on, you've never had a thought. We move and breathe and live and have our existence with a mixture of belief and doubt. And so do you know what Jesus did? He shows up the next week and with Thomas, he didn't shame him for needing proof. He didn't belittle him for not being spiritual enough to take the other brother's word for it. He says, you need what you need. You need to, here, put your hand here. Put your fingers right here. I want you to feel that I am alive. Somebody here needs to understand that Christ wants you to live so desperately, so deeply, so passionately. He wants you to live and experience the resurrection that he's, he's trying to show you. Put your hand in my wound and you will feel that I understand your wound. Well, here's what's interesting about chapter 20. At chapter 20, it kind of ends with that kind of story and it ends with a very curious couple of verses. If you're in John chapter 20, here's how the chapter ends. And I love this. I just recently uh, was shown this and I just, chapter 20 ends with these words. Now here are these resurrection encounters. There's Mary. The guys go away. They begin to believe. They gather in fear. Jesus shows up. Thomas comes the next week. All these wonderful things happen in chapter 20. And then it appears as if chapter 20 comes to a close. Chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The end, roll credits. In fact, most scholars believe that is the original ending of chapter 12 or 20 and the ending of the gospel of John. It ends right there. It's a fine sign off. It's a, it's a, it's a, we're done here. It's as if he's saying, man, there's a lot I could tell you. There's just no time. There's, there's no time to get into all that he has done. But I've told you these few things so that you know it's for you too. But then he does something interesting. He's like a Baptist preacher. He doesn't stop talking chapter 21. He's like, everything's over. There's a lot that I haven't told you. Um, okay, but there's one more thing. And in chapter 21, he tells this story, just in case there is someone who thinks that you don't fit in the story of resurrection. It's almost as if John is saying, yeah, 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 he's not finished. He's not finished with you. And then he tells the story of the men who go fishing 
and they're down and they're depressed and they're disillusioned. They're about to give it all up and, and they go fishing and they go in this boat out on the sea and on this boat at sea is Peter. Do you remember Peter? And how Peter was the one who said, I will go with you to the very end. Even if it requires my life, Lord, I will never turn my back on you. And that's when Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. He said, no, no, you're right about most things. You're wrong about that, Lord. It's not going to happen. And then he did. He, he, he failed. I mean, blew it. There was a failure of nerve. There was a failure of faith, a failure of courage. And, and there he was, an absolute mess of a man. And here he is, just floating on the sea. Floating on a sea of his own shame. Have, have you ever been buoyed by your own remorse, regret, and shame? And then all of a sudden, in the midst of his self-loathing, there's a voice from the shore. Have you caught any fish? They answer back, no. Try casting your nets on the other side. They cast the nets. They bring in a haul of fish and they recognize someone says, it's the Lord. And then we're told in the scriptures that Peter, it's a really kind of a... They were told when they recognized it's the Lord, it says, then Peter got dressed for he was naked, which is weird. <laughs> You're right, right? It's so weird. Uh, the Bible's got really cool, weird stuff in it. And, <laughs> and it says, after he got dressed, he jumps in the sea. And you and I think, oh, it's, he's going to jump in like Forrest Gump and just beat the others to the shore. Oh, Lord, you're here. I'm so glad. Hey, about that thing the other day, can we just kind of, are we good? Are we, and he just, we think he's swimming toward the Lord, but the Bible never tells us which side of the boat he jumps out of. He sees the Lord, gets dressed because he was naked. He was vulnerable. He was already exposed in the soul. And he covers back up. And he jumps off maybe the other side of the boat. Maybe if I hide, he won't see. He'll never know. I'll never have to talk about it. And yet he has, you can't dog paddle forever. So he gets into the shore and Jesus has fish ready for him. And they eat and they do what Jesus does. And Jesus, disguised as his own life, asks him, do you love me? Three times, we know this story. Ask, and each time the intensity increases, do you really love me? What kind of love do you have for us? Seriously, Peter. And we recognize that Peter is being raked. He feels like he's being raked over the coals because in reality, Christ will meet you right where you are. But Christ, the one who confronts us, will first make us confront ourselves. And Peter says, yes. And once the risen Lord sees that Peter is owning his own failures and his own troubles, he says, okay, feed my sheep, tend my flock. We've got work to do, Peter, and there is no time to continue floating on the sea of your own shame and your own guilt. We got to get busy. Now live. And the resurrected Lord standing in front of him disguised as his own life says it's time for you to live. And that's what I'm telling to you, my brothers and sisters today. It's time to live. Every single one of us, if he comes disguised as our own life, my question to you is, what part of the messy life that you are living do you think Jesus is standing in front of asking you to live? Because that's where he consistently comes. Is it, is it possible that you are so disillusioned by the script that you wrote for your life and now it's all ripped up and you're disillusioned by the reality that, well, he left us and I, I feel abandoned and I, I, don't, I don't know what to do next. I don't have any control of the outcome of my life. I'm kind of disillusioned because I wasn't there and I'm not going to take their word for it. I'm, I'm only going to believe if I can see for myself. But let me tell you, if you are disillusioned by something in faith, it is okay to be disillusioned means that you are no longer under the illusion. It means that now you have eyes to see the risen Christ who loves you and wants you to live. It may be possible this very day, he's standing here. 
disguised as your life, saying, live. Maybe you're here today and and you're hearing these words and you have longed to live for a long time, but for whatever reason, you have... You've assumed that resurrection is for somebody else, that aliveness and faith is about somebody else. And I'm here to say that you're wrong. It is for you. And the resurrected Lord will nuance the way you understand it, the way you come to believe. He will meet you right where you are so that you can feel the fullness of his aliveness in your life. The only thing it requires is humility yieldedness, submission. And maybe right where you're sitting today, right now, you pray these words. I am tired, Lord. I am tired of keeping a life propped up that looks alive and looks full of faith and looks like it is a resurrected life when all the while I've been propping it up on my own, never allowing you to heal me, to forgive me, and to give me a brand new beginning. So all of that stops right now, and I pray that you would forgive me for the places in my life where I have broken life and I ask that you would heal me in those places where life has broken me and I had no control over it. And I will follow you and you will be my God and I will be your child. I pray that now by faith in your holy name, amen. And friends, if you prayed that prayer today or you prayed something that sounded or felt like that, I need you to understand that he heard you. The risen Jesus heard you. And your next step in faith is to simply share that with somebody, to tell somebody. That's why I'm asking our pastors if they would come and stand at the front of our sanctuary because at the conclusion of our benediction, we will be here to listen to you, to pray with you one-on-one. It may be that you come today because you recognize I just gave my life to something I've never given my life to and I don't know what to do next. And we'll talk to you and pray with you about that. We'll help you. It may be that you've given your life to Christ, but you recognize I've never stepped in the waters of baptism. I've never allowed the world to see that I am immersed in the belovedness of God. And maybe you come today and say, it's time for me to be baptized. It may be that you're coming today because you realize I've got to be a part of a family of faith. And I look around this place and I see people like me, people who are imperfect, who have unfinished stories, but who are all attempting to bring their doubt and their faith and and work it out. Join today. Come and join this church family and make JCBC your your church home. But whatever the decision is that God is prompting in you, don't wait another Easter. Don't wait another Sunday. Don't wait 10 more minutes. Tell somebody today. Now, at this moment in worship, we come to the most important moment. A moment when we offer words of blessing and we scatter into this world to live outside these walls as if we actually believe everything that we have affirmed in these walls. So as you're able, stand to your feet for the benediction. If we may join hands across the aisles and across the pews as one united family of faith, And we'll join hands singing because he lives in just a moment. But before we do, I urge you at the conclusion, come and speak to a pastor as we pray with you. But from this point forward, our prayer is this. Christ will go before you to prepare your way. Christ will go behind you in the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. 
Christ will go to your right and to your left, biding closer than even a sister or brother. Yeah. And Christ will go above you on the days when your dark clouds roll in to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day really does have the final word. Christ will go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly, here's the good news. Christ will go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his.